We must brace ourselves for days ahead. Let us strengthen and deepen our resolve to fight for a genuinely democratic Philippines. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We'll get started now. Uh, welcome to Military Bases and U.S. Empire, a conversation with David Vine, author of Base Nation. And that video that we just saw was our five-year recap of the Malaya Movement USA, what we've been up to for the last five years. And for folks who have not heard of the Malaya Movement USA, we are a grassroots, people-powered organization that upholds, defends, and asserts uh, genuine democracy, human rights, and uh, Philippine sovereignty. And so this topic is very near and dear to our hearts. We're very excited for tonight. And to introduce myself, my name is Julie Hamora. I'm the National Secretary General of Malaya Movement USA, based in New York City and a proud member of Malaya New York who helped put this event together. Uh, so as we get started, we'll set a little context, uh, also share some webinar reminders. Um, just to note that this webinar is being recorded and it is also live streamed on the Malaya Movement USA Facebook page. Everyone is currently on mute to minimize sound as we have this really engaging conversation between Sam and David Vine. And please, we want to engage with you, share your comments, um, your questions, engage in the chat box with us. And to introduce our, our speakers, we have um, some incredible speakers today. We have David Vine, who is the professor of political anthropology at American University in Washington, DC. He's authored the books, Base Nation, How US Military Bases Abroad Harm America and the World, The United States of War, A Global History of America's Endless Conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State, which was a finalist for the 2020 LA Times Book Prize in History, and also The Island of Shame, The Secret History of the U.S. Military Base on Diego Garcia. Um, they're also part of the network of concerned anthropologists, and he has helped to compile and write Militarization, a reader and the counter counterinsurgency manual or notes on demilitarizing American society. Uh, they have also um, written, their, their writing has also appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, Mother Jones, Boston Globe, Huffington Post, and the Chronicle of Higher Education, among many others. He's also a board member of the Cost of War Project and a co-founder of the Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition, Closure Coalition and a contributor to TomDispatch.com and Foreign Policy and Focus. So we are really, really honored to have him here today. And then, of course, we have um, Sam, who is a member of Malaya Movement New York, is a lawyer, and uh, this topic is also 
very near and dear to their heart. They are originally from San Diego, California, one of the biggest military cities in the US and grew up in a big military family. And also for myself, uh, my whole family immigration story and journey into uh, being forced, really forced to migrate to the United States is rooted in uh, US militarism. My father and both my uncle um, were recruited directly into the US Navy and that's where our story begins uh, because of the military bases in the Philippines. And so some background and context on this event before I turn it over to David and Sam. Uh, this important event and conversation around US military bases really comes at a crucial time as we see escalated tensions and warmongering between the two superpowers of the United States and China and the Asia Pacific region, placing the Philippines and other countries in the region in between the crossfires of two military superpowers. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. arrives today in the United States. He may already be here as we speak, as he embarks on a state visit with President Biden and other US officials starting tomorrow in Washington, DC, with the supposed goals to bring about lasting socioeconomic partnerships, economic defense and security cooperation, uh, ensure respect for human rights and uphold international law. So we in the Malaya movement, it's our view that if we look through history, it's clear that these buzzwords, while they may sound um, nice, they're really empty. And the real intent behind these meetings are to sell out Philippine sovereignty in exchange for US aid, invest investments, um, to give the administration political legitimacy, despite the brutal legacy, the ongoing human rights crisis under Marcus Jr., and also uh, the long history of atrocities under the Marcos political dynasty. And so, there have been many developments when it comes to US militarism in the Philippines just in 2023 alone. Tomorrow's state visit comes off of the heels of the Biden administration brokering access to four new US military bases in the Philippines under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement this past February, bringing it to a total of nine bases. And after the recent two by two um, ministerial meetings between the US and the Philippines, uh, $100 million in aid will be allocated to expedite the completion of those bases this year alone. Imagine how much money can go to housing, jobs, education. And these new military bases, um, the four new sites are Naval Base Camilo, Osayas, and Santa Ana, Cagayan, Camp Melkor, De La Cruz, and Gamu, Isabela, Balabac Island in Palawan, Lalo Airport, and Cagayan. And that's on top of already five bases in the Philippines, where the Philippine has granted access to the US military within Philippine military bases. So the locations that already exist are Cesar Basa Air Base in Pampanga, Fort Magsaysay Military Reservation, Lumbia Air Base, Antonio Batista Air Base, and Mactan Benito Ebuen Air Base. And reasons that the Biden administration gives for the ba these bases to strengthen interoperability between the two um, armed forces of the United States, um, to allow uh, the ability to respond more seamlessly in terms of shared challenges in the Indo-Pacific region, including natural and humanitarian disasters, uh, providing places for joint and combined training and improving regional readiness. Um, but we know we'll delve more into this in this very important conversation that it really is serving as a, a launch pad for war in the Asia Pacific region where the Philippines is then caught in the crossfires. And this state visit also follows three back to back joint military exercises this past month alone. It's really been a busy time in the Philippines. Uh, the Salaknib exercises, the Balakatan exercises, and coming May 1st through May 12th is going to be exercise cope thunder exercises. And the Balakatan war games were the largest exercises uh, conducted in history with some, over 17,000 troops participating, 12,200 of which were American troops. Um, and before we transition to the conversation with David and Sam, uh, the news hook for this event really is, you know, prompting, uh, prompted the event with the announcement of the new bases in the Philippines. And while the Philippines does have a long history of U.S. colonialism, uh, U.S. intervention, U.S. presence in the Philippines, it's by no means the only country in the world with U.S. military bases. There are similar experiences all over the world where the U.S. has over 750 military bases 
um, in more than 80 countries um, around the world. And many of the circumstances around US military presence in the Philippines exist in those other countries. So it's important that we analyze these recent developments in the Philippines with an internationalist lens and through solidarity, of course. So with that said, I will turn over the mic to both David and Sam to get this conversation started. The floor Thanks is so yours. Thanks so much, Julie, for those introductions and for orienting us on the reason for tonight's event titled Military Bases and the U.S. Empire, hosted by Malaya Movement New York and Malaya Movement USA. And of course, a big thank you to author and professor David Vine for joining us today. David, I'd like for you to start us off by setting the geopolitical context. Who are the major superpowers or key players today who are fighting for economic and political dominance around the world? Thank you, Sam. And I do just want to say a quick thanks to all everyone who's been involved in making this event possible. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today and watching later. Um, I am really feel very lucky to be working with Malaya USA and Malaya New York. I'm actually a former um, Brooklyn resident, so especially happy uh, for that reason. Mm, uh, but I, I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Malaya. I mean, I, it's, you know, the U.S. movement against killings and dictatorship and for democracy in the Philippines. Of course, we need the same movement against killings and dictatorship and for democracy in the United States and around the world. And, and you asked about the, the superpowers um, in this geopolitical context. I think it's important to start with the superpower that is people power. Uh, Malaya USA, I see as part of a, a long struggle for democracy in the Philippines and worldwide, uh, but one that has been struggling against uh, colonialism, first in the form of Spanish colonialism and then US colonialism from 1898 until Philippines independence and the kind of neo-colonial rule that we saw after Philippines independence and that in many ways is accelerating with this new basis deal. The basis deal is, is much bigger than just four new bases and a total of nine bases. And, and that's um, what I'm excited to, to get into today. I, I should acknowledge also that I'm sure there is a lot of expertise in this Zoom room, in this, in this virtual room. And I'm excited to speak with people, engage with people, discuss, take questions uh, as the, the event proceeds. Uh, I'm in some ways uh, relatively new to, to studying the U.S. military presence in the Philippines or a relative neophyte. I've, I've been studying it for um, something like 20 years or so um, as part of research into U.S. military bases that was first spurred by one military base in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And I always feel like it's important to credit uh, the, the people of, of Diego Garcia and the rest of the Chagos Archipelago, a very isolated archipelago of islands, um, relatively close to the Philippines, but still quite a bit, quite uh, a distance away. Uh, and these are the, the Chagosian people who were forcibly removed from their homelands in the late 1960s and early 1970s as part of the construction of a U.S. military base on their largest island, Diego Garcia. And th that's the when I was introduced to the Chagosians, uh, this is what really opened my eyes to the huge collection of U.S. military bases around the world, including uh, in the Philippines over time. Uh, people in the Philippines know all too well the effects of U.S. bases, beginning with the huge bases at Subic Bay and Clark Air Base that were in the Philippines until 1991, 1992. And since, since that time, since, and this goes back to the superpower question and the power of people and people's movements, it was because of the movement of people for democracy in the Philippines that the United States was kicked out of the bases uh, at Subic Bay and Clark and other, other bases in the Philippines. Uh, and that's the kind of movement we're gonna need to see today to ensure that the United States does not continue to build up its military presence in the Philippines, and that as importantly, or part of that struggle must be to choose a fundamentally different path than the path that is currently frighteningly taking us closer and closer to a war between the United States and China and the United States as allies, currently the allies like the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others. 
uh, that is the path that the superpowers are are headed down. And so the, the superpowers in question are, of course, the United States and, and China. And elites in both countries are frighteningly taking us closer and closer to a path of war, a, a war that could be sparked accidentally uh, just in the last week. We saw Coast Guard vessels belonging to the Philippines and China uh, nearly colliding in the South China Sea, in the Philippine Sea. And even uh, an accidental clash like that could so easily spiral out of control, given the context of escalating military tensions that the United States in particular, I think, is contributing to, but Chinese leaders as well are, are clearly escalating military tensions. And the, this spiral, I fear, uh, is only leading us sort of down a path of war when we need to choose a fundamentally different path. And that, of course, is a path of diplomacy, democracy, negotiation, and cooperation on the real threats facing people in the Philippines, people in the United States, people in China, and people around the world. Right, right. Uh, I'd like to now just start with or go into the basics. What are military bases? What are military installations? You write in your book about lily pads. What are those and how do they differ from military bases as people might traditionally know them? Absolutely. You, you asked a very simple question before and then I rambled on and on. So Sam, by all means, um, feel free to cut me off at, at any point, as I said before. But uh, but military bases, I, I think you know many people in the audience are probably familiar with military bases, either because they live near them, some of you may have worked on a, a base, um, but though, for those unfamiliar, military base, bases range in size from massive city-sized bases to much smaller bases that are sometimes referred to as, as lily pads. Just for, for context, the base at Subic Bay, so the base that the United States was forced to, to leave because people uh, in the Philippines forced uh, the Philippines Senate uh, to kick the United States out. The base at Subic Bay is somewhere between the size of the city of Chicago and the city of New York. It's almost as large as the city of New York, a massive, but literally city-sized base. Um, and sometimes US bases around the world have tens of thousands of troops and family members, hospitals, fast food restaurants, schools, the whole everything you would see in a, a, a city. Um, and, and often they are a kind of Americana imported into a, a foreign country. Some bases are at the other end of the spectrum are, as you said, lily pad bases. We, we need to be careful about the, the language around bases because often terms like lily pads, they seem sort of benign or you know natural. Um, sometimes they're called sites or in, in the case of this enhanced defense cooperation agreement, which I actually think is an enhanced danger cooperation agreement. That's how we should think about it. Uh, they're talking about access. The U.S. military will have access to Philippines bases, Philippines military bases in the Philippines. Uh, access is a euphemism for the construction of U.S. military facilities and effectively a, a U.S. base. Uh, so, uh, but some of the smaller bases do just have in sometimes dozens of troops or hundreds of troops. Sometimes it's just military contractors, which is another way to disguise the presence of a U.S. base. Uh, but I think just to, to wrap up here, I, I think it is helpful, uh, especially if you haven't lived next to a military base, to try to imagine living next to miles upon miles upon miles of fence line and uh, within which one finds a huge concentration of military personnel, of troops, soldiers, Marines, uh, sailors. Uh, as well as high-powered weaponry. Uh, depending on the service, we see uh, naval vessels, we see aircraft, we see tanks, we see missiles, we see bombs, we see highly dangerous and deadly collection of, of weaponry, and arsenals of, of kinds. Um, and, and, and imagine for a moment living next to that, especially whether it was a, the military of the country that you belong to or where you have nationality, or now imagine living next to a foreign military base, even a base belonging to a close ally and how that would feel. I think it's important to put ourselves in, especially for those of us with US citizenship, those of us who have never had the experience of living next to a foreign military base, 
I think it's very helpful and important that we consider how it would feel to live next to, for example, a French or British base, let alone a Russian or Chinese base. And what purposes does the US government claim are served by having US military bases abroad? So US leaders and, and others have long made all sorts of claims about maintaining US bases abroad. Basically since World War II, it has become something of a, a matter of faith, a kind of dogma, almost religious belief that the United States military needs to deploy hundreds of troops around the world and hundreds of thousands, excuse me, hundreds of bases and hundreds of thousands of troops around the world to ensure US national security. And this has simply gone unquestioned for decades, uh, despite plenty of evidence suggesting that you couldn't be further from the truth. That in fact, deploying hundreds of bases and hundreds of thousands of troops has greatly endangered US national security cost literally trillions of dollars, uh, helped launch, as, as I think Julie said before, and you said before, helped launch uh, long series of wars that have killed millions of people, um, all the while undermining US national security and, and often the security of countries hosting US bases. So the main claim has been that US bases abroad protect US national security, and then claims are made about protecting the security of the host nations and regional security. In some ways, it, it's, it's sad that we take such claims seriously for a moment when the historical record shows that US bases abroad have helped launch a long series of wars from the wars in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, to wars in Central America to, in, during the 1980s, to a long series of wars in the Middle East since a buildup began there in the 1980s. And then of course the last 21 plus years with wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, with the prior U US Gulf War um, before that in 1991. Uh, US bases abroad are, are, are weapons of war. They're the infrastructure of war. They're part of the infrastructure that makes war possible. And building up new US bases in the Philippines, far from defending the Philippines, is only going to make the Philippines more of a target and is part of a large scale US military buildup throughout East Asia that's going on right now, including in places like Australia, uh, new uh, nuclear arms agreements with both uh, Korea, South Korea. And, um, and Australia, um, buildups in Japan, uh, all of which are encircling China and only encouraging China, the Chinese government that is, to respond in kind, to respond militarily. Again, I think it helps to imagine how US leaders, how the US public would feel if China were to begin a military buildup anywhere in the Western hemisphere. China has zero military bases anywhere in the Western hemisphere, let alone close to US borders. The United States military has now 300 and somewhere around 317 military bases surrounding Chinese borders, 317 military bases in East Asia by the Pentagon's own count. This is um, and as part of this larger collection of military bases of around 750 bases around the world outside US territory. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised when this current buildup in the Philippines and throughout East Asia only encourages China to respond militarily. Again, and this is the, the, the spiral of militarization that I, I fear and that I think we should all be deathly afraid of because this militarization spiral is really some kind of a death spiral. And just to conclude here, I, th I think the, the key question we have to ask people in the United States, people in the Philippines, people throughout East Asia, people in China, question we have to ask is, do we want a war between the United States and China, the United States, the Philippines, and other allies, and China, or not? And in terms of these bases' efficacy, you've written that advances in transportation technology have largely erased the advantage of stationing troops overseas. Nowadays, the military can generally deploy troops just as quickly from bases in the continental United States and Hawaii as it can from many great bases abroad. Can you talk more about that? Do we really need bases? Let's you know assume for a moment um, that the level of US military involvement 
um, is appropriate. Um, do we really need bases outside of the United States? Do we really need to impose a burden on other countries like that? Uh, we don't for uh, many reasons, but, but indeed, what you're pointing to is that technological developments have allowed the US military to deploy its forces rapidly across large parts of the globe, uh, such that the, the value, military value, to suggest that there is any military value of, of military bases abroad that, that once existed uh, many, many, many decades ago, as, as during World War II and, and immediately after, has declined dramatically. The United States military can deploy its forces around the globe just as quickly in almost every case from bases in the United States as it can from anywhere else. Uh, again, the, the, the creation of four new bases in, in the Philippines does not change anything about the military situation in East Asia, other than, again, to escalate the military tensions and, and further encircle China, uh, when there are already far, far, far too many US bases in the region. Uh, but, but indeed, what you're, what you're pointing to is the way in which this is a long, outdated strategy, a strategy that was born during World War II in the early days of the Cold War and that got entrenched entrenched largely, I would say, for a range of reasons, but, but largely because some people are benefiting. Some people have benefited from this massive collection of US bases around the world, and some people are benefiting from this buildup. And I think that's one of the first questions we should ask when we hear the announcement of this new base deal, as well as other um, military agreements. Who's benefiting from all this? And there are indeed people benefiting. Uh, largely, they're, they're parts of the military industrial complex in the United States, meaning weapons contractors, uh, base contractors, those who build up these bases, as well as some corporations in places like the Philippines, host nations, uh, there too. Businesses and elites are, are benefiting in a, a range of ways from this hyper-militarization and this, this hyper-militarized strategy that, again, is precisely the wrong path that we should be taking at a moment when we need to be choosing a different path, a path of diplomacy, negotiation, and again, cooperation on the, the real threats facing us, like, for example, I don't know, global warming, um, pandemic preparedness, uh, addressing poverty in the United States and the Philippines and around the world, hunger, malnutrition, among many, many others. All the while, we're squandering billions upon billions of dollars on bases uh, that could be far better spent. Going back to the lily pad uh, topic for a moment, you've written that lily pads allow host nations to claim, or I'm sorry, allow the US military to claim um, there are no US bases in Honduras. This is their base. Um, and the lily pad model has allowed the US to make a return to the Philippines uh, within barely a decade of the 1991 and 1992 eviction from Clark Air Base in Subic Bay. Um, we know that US negotiators signed the Visiting Forces Agreement in 1996 that allowed the US military into the Philippines for a variety of military exercises and training, one of them being uh, the Balikatan exercises that Julie was just talking about, which is a Tagalog word for shoulder to shoulder. Um, in 2003, the U.S. military was participating in 18 exercises a year. By 2006, there were 5,500 U.S. troops involved, almost twice as many as the 2,800-person Filipino contingent. By 2008, the 6,000 Americans were three times the number of Filipinos. And this year's exercise had the highest number of participants in the history of the exercise, with 17,600 participating troops in total, over 12,000 of those being U.S. military troops and the other 5,500 or so being Filipino troops. And so commentators have asked the question, between these two strategic allies, who really benefits more from Balikatan? And aside from these training exercises, the Enhanced uh, Defense Cooperation Agreement, or EDCA, which was signed into um, in, in 2014, allows a still larger U.S. presence allowing for the creation of five lily pad type installations in the Philippines. But both governments insist the agreement will create respect for the Filipino uh, for Filipino sovereignty 
and create no U.S. bases, um, but still some Filipinos are assessing whether the plan violates the country's con constitutional ban on foreign military bases. Um, so despite what the Biden administration has said are its reasons for opening these new bases, what's your assessment on why these bases are really being established now in light of what you know about the U.S. military's goals? Threatening China. Again, uh, the and and I'm I'm sorry to say that of course you know this is a lot of really Orwellian language that's disguising what's going on. Respect for Philippine sovereignty is is uh, you know a, a lie. Uh, Philippine sovereignty is is not being respected. This is a bunch of sort of military mumbo jumbo that is disguising a U.S. military-based presence that is growing in the Philippines and that the U.S. military has sought to expand ever since getting kicked out of the Philippines in, in 1992. It was just within a, a matter of five or six years that there was the signing of, a, of the Visiting Forces Agreement in 1998 uh, that really paved the way to all these later agreements. And I, I think we shouldn't mm, kid ourselves. Uh, the announcement of four new bases you can be sure that the U.S. military has plans for a, an even larger expansion, and that's part of why the work that Malaya USA and, and others in, in the Philippines and around the world are doing, that's why it's so important that we push back now, um, to push back against the creation of these bases, to push back against any future expansion, to call for the withdrawal, complete withdrawal of the U.S. military from the Philippines, and a de-escalation of, of the U.S. military presence and, and military tensions. Uh, the, the language, as you, you suggested, of lily pads uh, often is, is a way to either evade um, legal prohibitions on a foreign military presence, as in the Philippines Constitution, uh, and to hide the U.S. presence both from locals in the Philippines and from people in the United States. Uh, we need to know what is going on, and what is going on is an increasing threat to China. These these war they call them exercises. You know, you, you exercise at the gym. You exercise when you go to Central Park or wherever you know a, a local park. These are not exercises. These are war preparations, and they're war preparations intentionally designed to threaten China. Uh, again, one of the claims made about about U.S. bases abroad and U.S. troops abroad is that they deter enemies. It's important to point out and to say, if when, when any, whenever anyone makes such a claim, prove it. There is little, if any, evidence, academic evidence or any evidence, showing that U.S. based presence abroad is a deterrence, an effective deterrence. In fact, the, again, the historical record evidence shows that U.S. bases have been offensive weapons, launch pads for war, while also imposing tremendous harms on, on locals living around U.S. bases abroad. And I, we'll, we'll get to some of those uh, harms and damages in, in a while, but the, there is a clear record of, of harm caused by U.S. bases in a range of ways, uh, beginning with the wars that they have launched. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the construction of new bases in the Philippines, along with others in, in places like Australia and Okinawa, are only encouraging uh, militarization of the, re of the region. They're only encouraging China to respond militarily. Because again, how, how would the United States, how would U.S. leaders feel if China were to build literally a single base anywhere near U.S. borders, for example, in Mexico or somewhere in the Caribbean? How would U.S. leaders respond? How would people in the U.S. public res respond? We would call for, many would call for, a military response to such a development. And, and we don't even have to, this doesn't have to be a thought experiment. In the Cold War, the most dangerous moment of the Cold War was when the Soviet Union dared to build a single military base anywhere near U.S. borders in Cuba, a missile base in Cuba. And this is what led to the Cuban Missile Crisis that brought the world closer to all-out nuclear war than we have ever been, at least until now, uh, in, amid the, the war in Ukraine, which also uh, runs similar risks as we're seeing rising in East Asia of uh, a direct military clash between the United States and Russia that could all too easily become a, a nuclear clash 
that could literally end human existence on Earth. Uh, many of uh, many folks have no memory of, of the, the threat of nuclear weapons um, because they were born after the end of the Cold War. This is something I grew up with, and, and many, many are aware for a variety of reasons. But uh, if there was a nuclear war between the United States and China and Russia, for example, uh, Princeton University researchers have shown that something like 5 billion people could die. That's billion with a B, basically almost all of human humanity on Earth. And life on Earth would be such that the entirety of humanity would be endangered. We talk about the existential threat of climate change, of global warming. Uh, there is an immediate existential threat to all humanity and all life on Earth in the form of nuclear weapons. And that's part of what is at stake when we're talking about the construction of new US military bases in the Philippines. We're talking about the escalation of military tensions and the uh, progressive march down a path toward war that could be a nuclear war between the United States and its allies, including the Philippines and China, that could literally endanger all of human existence on Earth. So we've been talking a little bit around this topic, but I'd like to now get specific about the negative effects of military bases abroad, um, more generally, including in places other than the Philippines. You've written about the displacement of locals, danger to locals who are permitted to stay in their homes, environmental harm, and sex-based violence, among other types of harms. But can you walk us through all of the different ways that military bases abroad inflict harm on communities? indeed uh, inflict a, a wide range of harms, and that's part of what I document and show in, in my book, Base Nation. I was lucky enough to get to travel around the world to U.S. bases ab abroad, and I didn't have the chance to go to the Philippines, because, in part because the presence was relatively small at that point when I was conducting the research, but I traveled to Okinawa, other parts of Japan, South Korea, places like Honduras, Guantanamo Bay, bases in, in Italy and Germany, among others. And one sees around the world a, a wide range of harm, uh, again, beginning with the wars that are launched with US bases abroad. Uh, again, places like Iraq and, and Afghanistan, those wars couldn't have happened without the huge infrastructure of bases, not just in the Middle East, but actually, what are those bases in, in Europe doing? Are bases in Italy defending Italy? What enemies exactly does Italy have right now? What threat of invasion does Italy face right now? Bases in Italy and Germany largely have been used to launch and maintain wars in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and among others in the Middle East. But when we look at the presence of US bases around the world, one sees a track record of harm, as you mentioned, including the displacement of locals. And actually one of the earliest cases in which we saw this outside North America was actually in the Philippines. Clark Air Base uh, was uh, led to the displacement of, of locals in, in the Philippines after US forces occupied Clark uh, around during the, the War of 1898. Uh, and one sees this continuing through the 20th and into the 21st century with locals displaced by the creation and expansion of US military bases abroad. Environmental harm happens basically anywhere you have a military base, anywhere in the world, domestic bases, foreign bases. Bases are not good for living things. Um, they are, again, large concentrations of high-powered, deadly weaponry, highly hazardous chemicals, other hazardous materials. Uh, they have a long track record of damaging the local environment. And that's part of why uh, bases like Clark and Subic Bay have so much contamination. And, and, and I'm sure people here in the room can probably speak to that better than I. Uh, there are also, if you look at the areas surrounding US military bases abroad, frequently they're not flourishing communities. They tend to look a lot like red light districts um, with often exploitative sex work industries, uh, again, people here in the room, I'm sure, can speak to the, that experience in the Philippines. Uh, there was a, a huge ex and exploitative, sexist, misogynistic sex work industry around U.S. bases, especially Subic Bay uh, in the Philippines, and one saw and sees 
similar dynamics in, in South Korea and Japan today. Um, and then you see a, a range of other harms. You know, one of the other claims and uh, defenses of maintaining huge numbers of bases abroad has been that US bases spread democracy. Again, this should be and is a laughable claim, a laughable claim. At least 38 of the countries currently and colonies currently hosting US bases, 38 of their approximately 80, are in less than democratic countries. Uh, all the bases in the Middle East, um, Qatar, let's just take Qatar as an example. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, the, the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup was in Qatar. There was a lot of attention and deserved criticism of the government of Qatar for its treatment of, of workers, of, of um, non-citizen workers who were imported to build the stadiums and build other infrastructure for the World Cup. There was a lot of criticism, appropriate, deserved criticism of the Qatari government's treatment of LGBTQ uh, folks and the community at large. Uh, but no one asked amid all that criticism why the United States has now at least two military bases, quite large bases in, in Qatar that have been there uh, for decades and have been supporting the Qatari government. The presence of U.S. bases in other countries provides de facto and often quite explicit support for the local government, governments that are often not only less than democratic, but often murderous regimes, the Saudi government. Uh, there are still US bases in Saudi Arabia. There are bases in Jordan. There are bases in the United Arab Emirates. There are bases in Djibouti. Uh, there are uh, bases in a number of US colonies, often called territories. Uh, the Philippines, of course, won its at least de facto independence, but Puerto Rico, Guam still host huge numbers of bases. Uh, and part of why they are still in a colonial relationship with the rest of the United States is because of the presence of US military bases. The US military likes having bases in places that don't enjoy full democracy. And that's why one sees this long standing pattern of US bases in undemocratic places. Uh, again, where the United States military and the United States government and US taxpayer dollars are actually blocking the sp spread of democracy rather than encouraging the spread of democracy. Can you explain the link between U.S. military forces and host nations' armed forces that U.S. military bases abroad facilitate? Yeah, it's an important dimension of the presence of U.S. bases. U.S. bases, I think we can really see as as part of a, a, an array of relationships between the US military and the larger US government and host nations and host nation militaries. And I think what one sees in particular in a place like the Philippines and, and elsewhere is the creeping uh, acceleration of a, a, of a process through which the local host nation military is becoming a subsidiary part of the US military. We're talking about the creation of proxy militaries effectively. Uh, US leaders have realized really since the abolition of the, of the draft, uh, they've had a labor problem. They, they've had a problem recruiting people in the United States into the US military. And this has actually gotten worse in recent years as people have been leaving all sorts of jobs. Uh, but uh, for a range of reasons, uh, US leaders, US military, uh, officials have been looking for ways to solve that labor problem, and foreign militaries have often and increasingly been the answer. They're also a way to, to engage in military combat operations without the kind of criticism that comes when you send U.S. military personnel abroad. So one sees in the creation of U.S. military bases abroad, not just the creation of the bases and the deployment of U.S. troops, but an increasing integration of local host nation militaries into the US military, uh, such that they become subsidiary, subsidiary parts of the US military on a de facto basis, and then something like a, a proxy army frequently. And this also gets intermeshed with arms deals uh, that are frequently offered to host nations as part of the negotiation to get a US base abroad. Uh, they're a way to sort of sweeten the deal for elites. They say, oh, we'll also, you know, give you access to high powered US weaponry that otherwise you wouldn't be able to buy. Uh, so there's a whole range of military and economic relationships wrapped up in the presence of US bases, uh, all of which are not for the benefit of, of course, of host nations, 
uh, or people in the United States, except for a small number of elites and corporations that benefit from these kinds of arms deals and base construction deals, among others. And we know that in the Philippines, the Filipino military and national police are particularly violent. The first Marcos regime was supported by five American presidents and lasted for 21 years from 1965 to 1986. Under the Marcos regime, the military committed over 3,000 murders, tortured an estimated 35,000 people, and arrested 70,000. Bodies were often dumped in the street for display. In the capital of Manila, the Marcos government hired hundreds of secret marshals to shoot petty criminals on site and in the countryside to suppress the growing communist insurgency. 110,000 local militia were given arms to terrorize suspected communists. Um, and it might be hard to believe, but we know that Rodrigo Duterte's six-year reign from 2016 to 2022 was even more violent than Marcos Sr.'s. Duterte launched a war on drugs as part of his plan to end illegal drug use and drug trade. His drug war has claimed more than 30,000 lives, and scholars have described this humanitarian crisis as a genocide of the poor. Some bodies uh, bear the marks of torture, as with the first Marcos regime, with their heads wrapped in duct tape so that identifying them has been impossible, and bodies have been found with sayings written on them in Tagalog that read, uh, I am a drug pusher. Um, so what impact do you think U.S. military training and collaboration has on international forces that take such a violent approach? Yeah, the, um, uh, very painful as you read those statistics. And, you know, I, th I think I've been talking in, in I, I think this is a, a very dire and dangerous situation globally. I, I think hopefully you can, people have been able to understand the kind of urgency that I've been trying to communicate about the threat of a war between the United States and its allies and, and China. Um, but but I think we also have to pay attention to the kind of daily, deathly violence, deadly violence that the U.S. military presence around the world has been enabling, including in places like the Philippines. Though, of course, there were there were tensions between the Duterte government and 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 U.S. governments. Um, but the the U.S. military uh, alliance with the Philippines continued during the Duterte regime. And the kind of murder that, that the Duterte government and the Marco senior government practice, we in the United States should be beyond outrage that our taxpayer dollars and our deployment of military forces and bases to places like the Philippines, that's, that's what we're supporting. Uh, we are, do not have clean hands if, if we have military bases in a country uh, where 30,000 people are being murdered. Uh, by the government and, and supposed security forces. Um, this is, I, I think we need to be beyond, beyond outraged. Let's now talk about the movement to shut down U.S. military bases. Uh, you've written in your book that closing foreign bases is one of the rare ideas that draw support from across the political spectrum. Um, and even the libertarian Ron Paul <laughs> made the closure of overseas bases a major part of his 2012 presidential campaign saying we have to build a strong national defense, but we don't get strength by diluting ourselves in 900 bases in 130 countries. What has the movement to shut down US military bases abroad looks like? Let me uh, share my screen for a moment uh, and, and hopefully it uh, will be helpful. Let me see if I can. Just to give people a, a clearer sense of, of what we're talking about, sometimes it can be hard to visualize. Uh, but indeed, as, as you said, there is a growing movement of, of folks in the United States and other parts of the world uh, across the political spectrum who are raising questions about why the United States continues to maintain so many bases around the world. So again, 750 around 750 and around 80 countries and colonies worldwide. Uh, what these bases are doing, whether there are better ways to defend the United States. And again, a growing number of people, including in the U.S. military, are saying, wait a second, we have, in the words of one Air Force general, we have too many doggone bases. 
Um, sadly, I think the, the Biden administration, like largely the Trump administration before it and the Obama administration before that and other administrations before them, are hijacked by a kind of foreign policy blob, as it's often referred to, this sort of mainstream foreign policy thinkers, people at think tanks, academics, who are totally swallowed the Kool-Aid on this longstanding dogma about maintaining US bases and, and troops around the world. And it's not just because they've swallowed a, you know, sort of benign, well, far from benign, but it's not just because they've drunk the Kool-Aid. There, there, there are people paying for that Kool-Aid. And that that's namely the, the military industrial complex uh, that benefits from this deployment of US bases and forces around the world. The Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition is a group that I've been working with for the past five plus years, and it represents people across the political spectrum, activists, academics, think tank analysts, and others who, veterans and veterans groups, uh, who have concerns about the presence of US bases abroad. And sometimes we disagree on, on some people are more concerned about the, the financial implications, the fact that the United States, US taxpayers are paying upwards of $80 billion a year, $80 billion a year on maintaining bases and troops abroad. $80 billion, it's a bigger budget than the State Department's budget, significantly bigger. It's bigger than every government agency budget except the Pentagon itself and the Veterans Administration. So the Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition has been speaking out on issues like uh, the, the creation of new bases in the Philippines. I should also point out that Malaya USA has a fantastic statement about, and about the, the creation of the, the new bases and the, and the new deal um, that, that people should take a look. But if folks are looking for more information about bases in the Philippines, bases, US bases worldwide, um, overseasbases.net is uh, hopefully a helpful helpful resource. Um, here, here's a, a map that uh, will hopefully also give people a sense of the collection of US bases abroad. Here it says 800, the number fluctuates and the exact number is, is basically impossible to ascertain. The Pentagon itself doesn't know precisely how many bases it maintains overseas. And part of the problem is the definition of a base, but the Pentagon, it, creates a list every year of its bases overseas. That list is notoriously inaccurate. It has, it omits well-known bases as well as secretive bases. Uh, but by my best count in 2020, it was about 800. The number went down a bit, um, around 750. But now with the creation of new bases in the Philippines and, and uh, actually also in Europe, of course, uh, amid the war in Ukraine, uh, the number is surely creeping up to around 800 again. Wow. Um, I'm glad that you talked about the coalition um, to shut down bases. We'd now like to share some photos of protests against the new Philippines bases if you wouldn't mind unsharing. And I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you are. It, it, just one other, in addition to the massive movement that evicted the United States military from bases in the Philippines in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, tomorrow is the 20th anniversary. A, a good friend reminded me of the Navy's eviction from Vieques, Puerto Rico. And uh, I, later I'll share a, a map of, of some of the protest movements that have opposed the presence of US military bases abroad. And then one sees such movements almost everywhere there are US bases abroad, but uh, some, some movements have been particularly uh, large and particularly active and particularly effective, uh, like the, the movement in, in the Philippines in the 80s and 90s and, and that in Vieques, Puerto Rico. And in 2003, right, Hawaii persuaded the Navy to return Kahulawi Island, home to important sacred sites for Native Hawaiians. Um, so you're right that it's important to claim these victories uh, everywhere that they happen. So now uh, shifting gears, I just want to talk about uh, the amount of money that the U.S. has sent to 
the Philippines um, and the Philippine military specifically. Since 2016, the U.S. has provided over $1 billion to the Philippine military and national police, and that's not even including, including arms sales, despite the atrocious human rights record under Duterte and under Marcos Jr. Um, but what one of Malaya Movement's campaigns is for the passage of the Philippines Human Rights Act, which was first introduced in June 2021 by House Representative Susan Wilde of Pennsylvania, uh, which proposed a bill aimed at putting an end to the abuses against the Filipino people committed by their own government by suspending U.S. aid to the Philippines until the Philippine government investigates and prosecutes members of the Philippine military and national police who are found to have uh, violated human rights until it withdraws the, Fili the Philippine military from domestic policy, and until it establishes protections for the rights of trade unionists, journalists, human rights defenders, indigenous peoples, and those who speak out against the government among other steps. What is your take on, um, and, uh, and on March 7th uh, of this year, 2023, Representative Wild reintroduced the PHRA, the, um, the Philippine Human Rights Act um, during this congressional session. So what is your take on laws like the PHRA that withhold financial aid from Philip from countries that commit human rights abuses? I'm really inspired and encouraged by by Malaya USA's role in in pushing uh, the, uh, the Philippines Human Rights Act. I think they it can be very helpful. Uh, there are also um, some laws on the on the books that that attempt to achieve uh, similar ends to prevent uh, the U.S. military and other forms of aid from going to, to militaries that have participated in human rights abuses. But I think this is really important, and I, I think there are actually ways, uh, if the bill would have to be introduced again, if it is, isn't passed in, in the current Congress, uh, there are ways that, I, that actually could be, the language could be expanded to include uh, U.S. military exercise and U.S. military bases, as because they are forms of support for that very military that has perpetrated human rights abuses. And again, we should be outraged as U.S. citizens, as U.S. taxpayers, U.S. residents. We should be outraged that our government is supporting these kinds of human rights abuses that it has been supporting the Philippines, and as I tried to allude to before, far, far beyond. Um, so I, I do think the, the Philippines Human Rights Act is, is a, a good step, and, and, and I, I think it, it's absolutely uh, important that we, we push, push for its passage and then push for even more expansive language that would point to the presence of U.S. bases and troops, including through exercise of war preparations, war games, although you know, war is never a game. I struggle for the uh, best language. but um the kinds of 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 war preparation exercises uh that we saw in the past weeks um this is another form of support for that very military that is has taken the lives of, of thousands and and participated in mass human rights abuses so what would you like to see happen what's on your wish list for shutting down bases abroad well, the Philippines is a pretty good place to start. There are many places to start, of course. Um, you know, I, I think a, a global process, Congress should be involved in a global process of examining uh, the presence and the uh, necessity of every single base abroad, because any base located outside the United States that does not have to be there is one, inflicting harm, and two, making war more likely, and three, wasting huge amounts, billions upon billions of dollars every year. Uh, but in the Philippines, I, I think the passage of the Philippines Human Rights Act uh, would be a very helpful step. I think uh, blocking the, the construction of these new four bases um, and blocking additional construction at the five existing bases um, should be major priorities. Uh, I think you know the the kinds of war preparation exercises that that we've discussed are, are clearly provocations and threats to China, and they are precisely uh, what we don't need to be doing and shouldn't be doing now because again they are 
only escalating military tensions and encouraging the Chinese government to respond militarily. It's no coincidence that the, the, the Chinese Coast Guard intercepted a Philippines Coast Guard vessel a week ago. Uh, China is, of course, looking for a way to retaliate to the announcement of this new deal between the United States and the Philippines for the four additional bases, uh, among other provo provocations that the United States government has engaged in in East Asia recently. And this is the kind of spiral that we are currently facing and currently on, and that this a uh, really group of elites in both the United States and the Philippines, and to some extent in, in China as well, they are taking us down this, this escalating spiral of, of militarization uh, that is, again, a, a, a war spiral, a spiral that's bringing us closer and closer to a war between the United States and China, the United States and its allies in China that should simply be unthinkable. And the Philippines, indeed, could be playing a far more productive role in moving the region, East Asia, um, and, and the globe in many ways, uh, toward the kind of cooperation we need to see. We need to see cooperation and negotiations on thing like, things like territorial disputes. China is currently occupying you know, some of the Philippines' territory, uh, as the United Nations court has, has, has shown. Um, Philippines should get that back, but it's just one of many territorial disputes that should be the focus of negotiations now, uh, in addition to the kind of cooperation on the real threats facing us, like global warming, pandemic preparedness, poverty, and that, that you know, that's what we should see announcements being made about. Um, just imagine, you know, what the, the governments of the Philippines and the United States could have announced in recent weeks, uh, rather than the creation of new military bases and major war preparations exercises, uh, why are we not uh, announcing cooperation on, you know, building green infrastructure, on addressing global poverty? Uh, this is what we need to be focused on, and this is the path we need to choose, and we need to push our leaders to choose. Uh, otherwise, we are headed down a path toward war and mass death. Absolutely. Okay, well, those were my questions. We have quite a few questions from the audience, but before we go to those, I just want to check in with you, David. Are there any other graphics or maps that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, why don't I just quickly show one or two more. Um, this is a, a map of major anti-base movements around the world. The X's are, are places where local movements and sometimes governments have closed. U.S. bases. Uh, the one comes to mind, the, the base in Ecuador, uh, which was closed in 2009, and, and some people may be aware that, that the president of Ecuador at the time said that he would renew the lease on the U.S. base in his country on, on one condition, if the United States allows the Ecuadorian military to build a base in Miami. I think this is a, you know, we got some laughs, but I think it was also helpful in showing how unthinkable it would be that there would be a foreign military base in the United States. And again, I think it's helpful for people in the United States, especially to think about how we would feel with foreign military bases on our soil. And I think when the United States military comes knocking, the United States government comes knocking, asking for foreign bases, one response sh from local government should be sure, you know, as long as we can build a base in Miami. Um, as part of a pushback. I think one of the other things that I didn't get a chance to talk about, another claim that's often made, and you see the State Department doing this and the, the Pentagon doing this in the Philippines, a claim that's often made is that, oh, this is great for the, the local economy, you know, this is a benefit to Filipinos. Um, now, first of all, you know, our military should not be a jobs creation program. Um, our, our, our military should not be a form of economic investment for a variety of reasons, including the dangers they pose, but also because they're a terrible form of economic investment. They're a terrible job creator. Investing in the research out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst has shown this. Investments in healthcare and education and infrastructure, among other sectors, are far better creators of jobs. They're far better forms of economic investment. And indeed, it, it doesn't take much to think about, okay, if you have a foreign military base, it's, a, it's a, a plot of land that's taking up a large amount of space and mostly employing foreigners 
it's a foreign military base after all, uh, rather than locals. Some locals are getting jobs, some local businesses surely benefit, absolutely. Um, but it's a terrible form of economic investment, and there are far better forms of economic investment that the United States could engage in in the Philippines if it wanted to, if it really cared about the Philippines, which it doesn't. It's trying to use the Philippines and, and put the Philippines into a kind of neo-colonial position of servitude that it maintained the Philippines in for, for decades after official Filipino independence in 1946. So I would just point to that. Um, if people, any of the, all, all of the, the maps that I've, I've shared uh, and a whole range of other maps uh, are available on, on my website, basenation.us, basenation.us, where you can download them. Um, I'll also upload all these slides onto basenation.us and onto my website, which is davidvine.net. Uh, there is a uh, list of social movements related to US foreign military bases, uh, the crowdsource list that people could add to, uh, showing um, anti-base movements through time. Uh, and again, this will be in the slides and I can I can forward it directly to, to you, Sam, and, and others, uh, which you might be able to put it on the Malaya USA website for those interested um, in, in both learning more and, and learning from other movements that have taken on and, and frequently won the eviction of US military bases. Uh, just one of the other maps that's available on basenation.us. And I'll shut up having talked too much already. No, that was great. Thank you so much, David. And yes, we would love to see any materials you have to share. Um, so now to transition to some questions from the audience. The first is, is it possible to develop an equitable business agreement between the U.S. and the Philippines? If so, how should the agreement differ from EDCA and the VFA. EDCA again being the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and VFA being the Visiting Forces Agreement. It's a, a good question. And indeed, I, I do think it may be per, more accurately known as the en Enhanced Danger Cooperation Agreement. You know, when you, when you have an agreement between two countries where the power differential is so great as it is between the United States and the Philippines, period, but especially because the Philippines was a former US colony, uh, it's very difficult to imagine an agreement that would uh, ensure the sovereignty and rights of, of the Philippines and Filipinos. Um, so I, I think my advice to the, the Philippines and Filipino leaders and, and other countries like it would be, don't get into an agreement with the United States military, the United States government. Uh, the Vietnam, for example, there's been some pressure on, on Vietnam to uh, allow a US military presence there remarkably after the uh, decades long war fought there. Um, but the, the Vietnamese government has, has I think charted a, a far better path staying away from both the, the threats of, of the Chinese and US governments. Uh, and, and, and there are other governments, of course, that have also resisted U.S. entreaties to, uh, to enter into an agreement. Uh, the only, you know, Germany probably is the, the country that has the most equitable basing agreement because of its economic and other power. But even there, um, the United States has a kind of extraterritorial power, a kind of de facto sovereignty on U.S. bases in, in Germany. Uh, so I, th I think the, the the long and the short is don't get into a base agreement. Don't allow U.S. bases on uh, on your soil. And 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 again, from a U.S. perspective, they're they're simply not needed, and and indeed are undermining U.S. security as well as host nation security in a whole range of ways. The next question is: How would you respond to this statement? And then there's a quote. If Filipinos want these bases, it's not the business of U.S. anti-war activists to tell them they cannot have them, end quote. To what degree is Philippine public opinion influenced by 120 years of U.S. colonialism and neocolonialism? Great questions. Uh, again, I think there are probably other people in the Zoom room and other people watching who could answer the question about U.S. public opinion. Indeed, you know, I, I think I can, um, I'm not an absolutist in, in the sense that I, I don't think that 
by definition, every US or foreign base abroad uh, is, is uh, illegal or should not exist. I can imagine some cases in which uh, a, demo, a, a truly democratically elected government could make an agreement with another government to base bases and forces in their country for de truly defensive purposes. But you know the extent to which the Philippines is a, is a, a democracy today is is a, a, an open question. It was especially an open question under Duterte, um, given his aspirations to sort of dictatorial powers. Um, certainly under the Marco senior regime, the Philippines was not a democracy um, until the pro-democracy movement won the ouster of, of Marco senior. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it is um, up to people in the Philippines uh, to hopefully take the, the reins of a pro-democracy movement once more and, and choose a, a different path. And as, as Malaya USA has said in the fantastic statement about this new agreement, um, choose an independent uh, foreign policy that actually benefits Filipinos. Next question is, in a multipolar world, some say you have to pick sides between the US and China. Can you share what you know about alternative options, such as the non-aligned movement? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, this is uh, the direction uh, that countries uh, who are trapped between the United States and China need to, to choose. The non-aligned non movement was a movement during the original Cold War uh, between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies. The non-aligned movement chose a, a third path, um, a, a path that was trying to avoid nuclear catastrophe and 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 you know the Cold War itself is a, a again a, a euphemism and a misnomer. Yes, there was no direct military clash between the United States and the Soviet Union, and that's why we call it the Cold War. But it was a hot war uh, all over the globe, and just need to look at the war in Southeast Asia, the war in Korea. These were you know proxy wars. The war in, in the original war in Afghanistan, where the United States was involved in a proxy war against the Soviet Union. The wars in Central America. Um, this is what uh, is at stake now, as we have clearly entered a, a new Cold War between the United States and China. But in many ways, it's a far more dangerous. Cold War uh, that is uh, bringing us closer and closer to a, a, a hot war, a, a war, a direct military clash between the United States and China that again could spiral completely out of control. So other countries have an important, critical, productive role to play to choose a different path and to, to push the United States and China uh, to engage in, in negotiations, in summits and talks, direct talks with one another. To, uh, to resolve the territorial disputes and other disputes, economic disputes, uh, rather than choosing this path of military escalation, of building new bases, of new arms agreements, nuclear sub-agreements, that is bringing us closer and closer to war. Next question is, is part of the expansion of bases in the Philippines a shifting of military forces out of Okinawa? Or is the U.S. military increasing its presence in both places? So I, I don't know, and there isn't nearly enough transparency when it comes to what forces particularly are being deployed to the Philippines for, for well, really since 2001, there have been a growing number of special operations troops in the Philippines operating U.S. special operations troops. Uh, there has been a dispersal of US military personnel from Okinawa, primarily to Guam and to a lesser extent, Australia. It's possible that a growing number would, would be shifted from Okinawa uh, to the Philippines. Uh, but there, we should not, I mean, the, the people of, of Okinawa have been under a, a truly oppressive US military presence since World War II. Um, and the removal of forces from the Okinawa is, is critical and important. Um, but it shouldn't be a military burden that's then shifted onto other people, whether in the Philippines or Guam or anywhere else. So it's it's hard to say where the troops are coming from and the 
Patagon itself may not fully have decided, but we will we will see. And and what we need is is bringing troops back to the United States, bringing troops back to California, for example, where there is plenty of room. It's important to point out when we and and people again across the political spectrum, including in the military, pointed this out. There's plenty of room on bases in the United States for troops to return home, where it's also important to point out, and members of Congress should be aware of this, if you close bases abroad, whether in the Philippines or Germany or Italy or Japan, and bring troops and their families back to the United States, it actually benefits the home states and districts of members of Congress. So there is, it's actually, it's also far easier to close bases abroad. The president can just do it himself. Uh, whereas closing bases domestically, as many may know, closing bases in the 50 states and Washington, D.C. is much more difficult politically. Uh, but you know, there are actually direct political benefits for members of Congress to be calling for bases, base closures overseas because it would mean the return of troops and family members to their states and districts. Right, right. Well, David, those are all the questions that we have. Thank you so, so much. I'm, not, I'm now going to pass it to Julie, who has a few calls to action. Thank you so much, Sam. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. And, and again, the Malaya movement is incredibly inspiring, and I feel just incredibly lucky to have been in this conversation and now to know more about your work and, and to continue to work together uh, to choose a fundamentally different path than sadly the United States and the Philippines are now uh, embarking upon uh, and to, to choose a path that, that leads us closer to peace. Yes, thank you so, so much, David. And we are so honored to work with you. And it's, you know, the first of many times, I hope. Uh, so the conversation doesn't end here. Please keep in touch. I know maybe some folks may have some lingering questions, uh, but some immediate calls to action that you can take part in are to support the Philippine Human Rights Act. It's currently H.R. 1433 in Congress and end the use of our tax dollars going towards funding human rights violations in the Philippines. If people aren't as familiar with um, what's been happening in the Philippines, the last under last president, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, there were over 30,000 killings in the drug war, um, um, over uh, 200 extrajudicial killings of activists, um, organizers, faith-based leaders, trade unionists, and there's over 800 political prisoners languishing in prison as a result of their um, advocacy and speaking out against um, human rights violations, the economic um, development, uh, even U.S. intervention in the Philippines. Uh, activists are often silenced. So our tax dollars, which have been now a billion dollars since uh, 2016 have gone to support the Philipp Philippine military and police. And in direct response, all the trainings, the mo monetary support has led to uh, many grave uh, human rights violations. So please help us pass this um, act in Congress. You know, it's not everything. The people power movement is definitely more, um, more pressing, more important, but this is one uh, tool that we can use to eliminate some of the harm being done in the Philippines. So learn more, visit humanrightsph.org. You can lobby your reps and sign the petition, tinyurl slash sponsor PHRA. And if you joined us today, you feel um, moved by all of the information we heard today, you can have your organization endorse the um, PHRA and show community support. We need that also in addition to uh, lobbying our representatives. And of course, getting organized, you know, taking down these major, major systemic issues when it comes to sovereignty, when it comes to the rights to life, land, livelihood, um, you really have to join a community organization. So if you're Filipino, even if you're not Filipino and you're interested in getting involved in human rights, democracy, sovereignty issues in the Philippines, please join us. Um, we'll drop the link in the chat. Um, get organized, join a community organization, or if you're looking for something else, we have many community partners we can point you in the direction to. Um, and then tomorrow, if you happen to be tuning in from DC, 
Um, or if you're not even in DC and you can watch a live stream or you want to support remotely, Marcos Jr. is here in the United States, has already arrived. He has a state visit coming up with President Biden at the White House tomorrow. Uh, and then he has many other meetings with US officials um, and you know, in, uh, institutions, I'm, I'm sure some foreign businesses. He is here really to sell out the Philippine sovereignty with military agreements economically. So we based in the US, for those who support uh, the, the movement for democracy, for true sovereignty in the Philippines, please show your support. Um, check out this link tree slash PH not for sale. It has our statement of why we're protesting. Um, it has different ways you can get involved, like donating. Um, you can even post on social media why you oppose the selling out of Philippine sovereignty. You oppose Marcos Jr.'s visit. Use these hashtags, PH not for sale, Marcos out of DC, Marcos not welcome. And let's make really a loud, um, send a strong message that, um, yeah, the Philippines is not for sale. Uh, and Lastly, um, if you can't be there in person, please consider donating. It takes a lot of money, and this is all grassroots, people-powered. We spend, um, you know, our time is truly like volunteer-run, oriented. So we're mobilizing even 40 people from the Northeast to go down to DC, and that takes a lot of funding just to do that. Placards, uh, bullhorns, all these signs, all these things, and also. Uh, legal defense funds um, and different initiatives. So please consider donating. And, you know, that is it for today and all of our calls to action. Please stay in touch. And David, Sam, thank you so much for having this conversation, educating us, and we'll send a follow-up email with all these resources um, that you shared with us today. Um, and thank you all. Um, have a wonderful evening. And um, yeah, let's stay in touch. Have a good night. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, David.